Our Father, we do thank Thee for this day and for the opportunity to speak of these things. And we pray for Thy blessing on this time. Guide us by Thy Spirit. We depend upon Thee. Give us clarity of mind and open our understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about education, and as we talk about it, we're going to refer to this as Christian education. I want you to open your Bibles just for a starting point, if you would, to the book of 2 Timothy. And we'll go all the way around and come back there, but in 2 Timothy, if you would, please. And I'm going to give you a number of things to write down and discuss, and then when we're finished, I'd like for you to ask me questions about these things. Education, uh, typically viewed by the average American uh, public education, is about um, the last resort. It's sort of, as someone has said, like public housing. If it's all you have, then you can get it. But when we're talking about education, for the most part, those of us who are Christians are talking about private Christian education. And one of the great problems I have is that we have private Christian education locked up and uh, only certain people get the keys to get into it. I think perhaps when we meet the Lord, we're going to face one of our, our greatest heartaches is that we knew so much that God taught us about His Word, about how to educate children and what children need to learn, what people can have in continuing education. And we somehow never got that to the people. We, we've, we've built walls and fences so that they cannot have access to it. And thinking as a Christian, when you think as a Christian, you think not just about what you know, but the obligation to share with everyone what you know. And that's what grieves me. And we'd, we'd like to see a real revolution, not just in what we refer to as public education in America, but the whole idea of people being moved to action and doing what God's given them to do to get, to get this out to others. I want to begin just by reading a passage that Paul wrote to Timothy, and we'll come back to it. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, without reading the entire chapter, we come to the 14th verse, and Paul says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I'm just absolutely taken by this verse, and the more I pray and meditate upon it, I think the more deeply God uses it in my life, just speaking to my heart. Continue. Continue thou. It's a personal thing with all of us. And the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And uh, you can break this verse down, of course, and come to the whole idea of what we refer to, especially as 20th century, now 21st century people, as critical thinking. How do you come to that? How do people make decisions? How, how, do, we, how do we judge these things and know what is right? In the book of Proverbs, God opens that book with uh, 10 things that we're going to be taught in the book of Proverbs. And one of those things is judgment, and there are other things involved in that judgment. But I think we've almost reached the end of critical thinking, and that's one of the great tragedies, one of the great tragedies in our world is that people can be herded around and not do thinking themselves about things. We'll come back to this, but I want you to write just a few things down as we consider uh, Christian education. First, we must consider the way God made man to be taught and instructed. This is the way God made man. He created man in His image, and our understanding has to begin with God. Uh, there's no doubt about this, that we, we begin our understanding of education with God. So it begins with God, not with the pupil, not with the teacher, but an understanding of God. In John chapter 12, verse 25, the Lord says, He knows what is in man, and we were made in God's image. And the unique thing about Christian education is that it does begin with God. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. If you'll open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just one verse there about how God made us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
The Word of God says in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, made in God's image, we understand from other places in the Bible, like Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, that there is a difference between the soul and the body. They can be divided because God talks about the power of His Word to divide, and the soul and spirit, rather. And so what we, what we deal with here is this trinity in which God has made us with a spirit, a soul, and a body. And I've said so many times, but I'll repeat to you, when God made us, He made us in His image. He made us with a spirit, soul, and body. In our spirit, we have a conscience. And that's where we're going in our instruction to the conscience recognizing this, recognizing how God made us. I want to read just a, a, a little statement at the beginning of our Declaration of Independence. Uh, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now I'm going to read something next here that all of you are familiar with since you were just school children that, that provides the uniqueness of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this goes on to talk about, of course, the fact that we should not try to infringe upon the consciences of people. Continuing, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And so, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. In other words, we, we had in our founding fathers the thought that God made us. And He made us with certain rights that He gave us. And we're to answer only to God for those things. Now think about a nation that would be founded on that principle. And what, what they're saying is that all of this begins with God. This whole civilized society we're attempting to create begins with God and what God has done. Now so for a a teacher or anyone else to speak in a dictatorial fashion, as uh, some of these, as we've come to know, these totalitarian Eastern European people under the, the, the very strong communist rule and that type of thing, to totally ignore the consciences of people and to order people around. Uh, they may say that, you know, that's uh, Nietzsche and his philosophy about the rulers and the herd, but that type of thing. But it's really, it's really deeper than that. When people are speaking and we identify something with those people, those people are only holding on to or held by a philosophy that's either of God or not of God. Often sometimes people say to, to me, uh, I'm a Lee Robertson person or I am a, a J. Frank Norris person as, as a Baptist. They identify which group they're with. And I want to say to them, I wouldn't say that I'm a follower of a man like that. Though they were good men, wonderful men. I don't think anybody could have loved Dr. Robertson outside of his own family uh, the way I loved him. But I'm only adhering to the same truth that Lee Robertson adhered to. I'm held by the same thing. Spurgeon's motto for his college was uh, to hold and to be held. And we're, we're saying that we identify with these same truths. Well, our founding fathers recognized from, from biblical knowledge there were certain things true of human beings. And because of what we know to be true about God and the way He created them, we're going to hold to these truths. And so we formed a government 
that finally decided that it would not try to rule and make some religion of any nature, of any kind, a mandate on the conscience of the people. So as a teacher, let's move that to our instruction. As a teacher, the first thing we have to recognize is the way God made man to be instructed and for that human being to make decisions and to come to conclusions in a way we refer to as rational or, or critical thinking. We've decided this is what we will believe. Now, uh, a conscience can be trained. I've, I've had a lot to say about conscience and, and written some things about conscience. I would uh, understand that if you're really interested in, uh, in teaching as I think you are, that you'd do all the study you could from the Bible about the consciences of people. But God made us spirit, soul, and body. In our spirit, we have a conscience that should answer to God. Uh, we also, when we're born again in our spirit, have the Lord indwelling us, because if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And then he gave us a soul. In our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. And it should travel that path, intellect, what are the, what are the facts, what is true, emotion, and then will. And uh, we have lived in such a visual world today that media is, is always trying to control people. I was trained as an educator at, at the University of Tennessee. I graduated with a degree in education there and taught in junior high school. And uh, I, I went through all the methods classes you would imagine somebody would do, I'd go through to, to do that. And I heard people say, you know, if we engage all the different gates, uh, all the different senses, we're, we're going to do a better job of teaching. Well, there's truth and error in that. Uh, for example, when God made us spirit, soul, and body, He gave us a body, and in that body we have, to the best of our knowledge, these five wonderful senses we refer to. And in those, in those senses, we can refer to them as gates. These are gates because we're more than a body. If we reduce instruction to one person instructing another person, just one body instructing another body, then we've forgotten how God made us. So we have to begin with God and begin with an understanding of how God made man to be instructed. It's God's design that man be instructed and begin to instruct others. That's God's design. So uh, miraculously, wonderfully, He gave us these gates through which things enter. But they don't just enter into our body, they enter into our spirit and our soul, the whole being. So the eyes are not just to see uh, with, they're to see through. And the ears are not just to hear with, they're to hear through. Imagine we're not just hearing with them, we're hearing through them and affecting not just our body, but our spirit and our soul which will affect our body. Uh, the mouth to taste through, not just with, and so the nose to smell through, the, the hands and body to feel through. And there's so, so much mystery to this, I'm sure, but let me just give one example. I like to talk about this because when I was a kid, we traveled around a lot. I lived in 19 different places, and my mother helped me count that up one day before I was ever in the third grade and only went to school six weeks in the first grade. And then uh, that was to two different schools. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't go at all in the second grade. But in one of those uh, episodes when we were moving around, we lived across from a lumber yard. And I, I can remember so many things about that lumber yard, not because of, of visual, but because my smelling awakens my mind to those visual things being released again in my mind. Because there was always the smell of fresh cut lumber. It was always in the air, fresh cut lumber. There's nothing quite like that smell. And every time I, I smell that through this gate, this nose, my mind acts and I think of that time I lived across from that lumber yard. For example, 
Uh, when, when I was in Alabama the other day speaking, I was taken to a, uh, to a place where they make cabinets. And uh, Paul Wellborn, who's an outstanding Christian, has a wonderful business there. And I enjoyed so much spending the day with him. And he took me through his plant, uh, a million square feet, uh, how they made the cabinets. But they were sawing and you could smell that. Well, while I was going through that and the smell of that fresh cut lumber, I was thinking about when I was a child. Now that triggered in my mind, it did something for me and it made me think about my mother. It made me think about when I got my first dog, we were there when, uh, when uh, my brother and I uh, were young and where we went to school. It made me think about uh, East Lake Courts where we lived. So that's how God made us. That's just one example. So we, we hear through, see through, smell through, taste through, feel through, because God made us spirit, soul, and body. And how many people are in a classroom instructing that never give thought to the Creator God and His intent, and that He made us to be instructed so that we might be able to instruct others? That's where it has to begin. Now we're going to come back to this, but I want you to think about it. A second thing I want you to write down is that we're laboring together with God as Christian educators. We're laboring together with God. This is, this is something beyond our ability. We're doing our human best, we trust, filled with the Spirit of God. And so you are a laborer with God. When you're going into a classroom or you're instructing somewhere outside a classroom, when you're exchanging ideas with someone, when we're engaged in any type of instruction, it's not just what we say and what they think, it's what the Spirit of God can do in people's lives. So you think about that. As a parent, you soon understand that there are things that get out of hand, and there's no amount of lecturing and reasoning, though that's good, that can change the behavior of someone. You need, you need supernatural aid to get the message through. Now, a Christian educator is there. He or she is saying all the time, I understand and I practice this. And it gives place to prayer. It gives place to Scripture. It gives place to waiting on God. Um, it gives patience as we wait upon the Lord. There's a, there's a world of things involved when we understand that we're laboring together with God. It helps us deal with our temper and short fuses. It really does because we understand we cannot manipulate. We're not going to live by force. We're not driving people. One of the things, one of the things that alarmed me early on about our president who's actually serving right now was that when I heard him speak, he spoke almost as one of these totalitarian people in a, in a communist country as if I'm speaking with authority and telling you what to do. Now there's a difference between leadership true leadership, and this dictator type attitude. If you ever get it, and it's all, all of us have it in us, if you ever get it, then the first thing you're doing, you're sinning against God and the way God made people. I'm a pastor, I've been a pastor for many, many years. I could not be a dictator because I know that people must come to their own conclusions. And I want to help them. As God has equipped them, He's equipped them. They're made to be instructed. They're put together that way, as I'm put together that way. It's God's desire that we exchange these things, one with the other. And I know a little bit about how it's received. And I know that people can get it. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, think about that. Personal. You can continue. Personal. The things which thou hast learned. What have we taught? What, what have people learned? Uh, we'll talk more in a little bit about uh, teaching and learning, but learned. And then that wonderful expression, and been assured of. That's where critical thinking has taken place. I have not closed the gap between my speaking and their doing and made it, look, I say it, you do it. That's what a lot of people are thinking. 
I think that's one of the great dangers in using so much visual because the visual can go straight to the emotion and the critical thinking of the hearer is affected and he or she just responds uh, to the visual. And it, it doesn't enhance, it limits thinking. For example, if you read a book and you're reading some novel or reading some story in a book, you have to imagine, you have to put the thing together yourself. You're choosing the characters. You're, you're imagining what they look like. Uh, you're, you're thinking of the tone of speech when, when they speak. Uh, you're using your mind and all these rational thoughts are coming. Critical thinking is being taking place because you're doing the staging, the directing, the producing, and, but if you watch it, then you're going to forever think that that particular character or movement is exactly the way it was portrayed, most likely the way it was portrayed in a visual effect. And so when we're engaging people in thought and conversation, and we're helping them to use these gates God's given them to come to their own conclusion, instead of saying, this is what this means, this is it, you just put down all reason and accept what I say. That may sound good for someone speaking the truth, but if you develop that kind of learning process, you've endangered people to listen to things and believe things they shouldn't listen to and believe. I, I don't like that. I don't like that going on today like it's going on. Uh, we do it everywhere from, uh, I, I see people in some churches having uh, an offertory played. And we have a certain way of doing that. And, you know, I'm not going to fuss about all of the country. But we like to hear the melody line played in a song so that we can, we can imagine the words because God speaks to us. And uh, we worship Him in spirit and in truth. And Truth is communicated in words. Now, it can be communicated with other things, but it's communicated in words. We must be very careful about our words. So as we're listening to that song and rehearsing the words of a familiar song that's been, uh, that's, that's been arranged for an offering, we think, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, or what a friend I have in Jesus, or at the cross, or whatever. And we're familiar with that, and we're worshiping God in those truthful words. It's just one example. But I see people today want to play, uh, play some sort of visual thing while that's going on and saying, this is what it means, this is what it means, it's pictures of scenery, whatever. And though God does declare himself in nature, should we limit people just by thinking that all, all it is is what they see? Is there no thinking process? Is there no time to consider and I think it's very important that the Spirit of God said, continue down the things which I've learned. And how long did it take you to become assured of them? They're things I've thought through for years. And now I'm assured of these things. It's like David taking the armor uh, of the army of Israel and saying, I haven't proved this. He was really saying, I haven't been assured of this. But I'm sure that God will, will help me. I know that, and God has helped me with the lion and the bear, but uh, I, ha I have never proved this, haven't been assured of this. And then he says, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Sources are all important. Sources, are, sources, considering the sources are so important. Knowing that you have relied upon truthful sources. And so Paul says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, has been assured of knowing whom thou hast learned them. So we're laboring uh, together with God in this effort. A third thing, we must understand the nature of truth. It cannot be separated from God. Truth cannot be separated from God. In the book of Colossians, uh, the Bible says in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now if God is before all things, no truth can come except as it proceeds from God. So all truth proceeds from God, all of it. 
And so we must always keep in mind the nature of truth. It cannot be separated from God. And this gives assurance and it gives authority to our teaching. Uh, no matter what subject matter we're dealing with, when we understand if we're speaking something truthful, if we discover that truth truly did come from God in God's design, God's great design. We're not just speaking uh, with, our, with our own uh, authority if we can say this is what God's Word says, this is what God does. For example, when I was a student I had to take science courses uh, to get a degree in education in a particular field I, I was following. And I don't know how in the world I got into it, but in this particular social studies program I was in, they insisted I have so many hours of science and biology, anthropology, geology. I, I took eight hours of geology. Interesting. And um, when I was taking some of these courses with the labs, you can imagine at a university what you hear and how you're challenged, how your faith is challenged. Uh, what, what you're hearing and what is so convincingly presented and millions of dollars have been spent to prove these theories. And of course, uh, there's a long war against God, as Dr. Morris said, and, and these people have already decided that creation is a farce. And so they've, they have done everything but use a scientific approach They've drawn the conclusion before they ever started the study, and they have to make everything appear to be what they've already decided it is. And any scientist will tell you that's not the way to search out anything. But and nevertheless, that's what, uh, that's what this evolution, or as I say sometimes, the appearance of intellectual atheism looks like. And that's what it passes as, intellectual atheism. And I understand that some people in context, in, in another century, at another time, uh, some preachers we even admire uh, became uh, uh, theistic evolutionists who were ministers of the gospel, and we still read and, and admire many of the things, because they had no other way of dealing with this. Uh, we, we've been gifted by, by lots of things, and one of the things 50 years ago was when these two wonderful scientific minds came out with the, the Genesis flood and the whole idea of a young earth and that type of thing. And now this generation has been greatly blessed just by that. That was one of the greatest books ever written, I think. But anyway, I'd sit in those classes and I would think, I'm having to think. You have to think. Am I receiving fact? How will I act upon this? What will will I make? Intellect, emotion, and will. It's going through my eye gate, ear gate. The process is in, in motion. Will I believe this? I'm not assured of this. I'm thinking of whom I, I'm hearing these things. It did not pass the test because I had already learned and been assured of things different from this. And because I had learned and been assured of, this did not become a part of my being. The knowledge that it, this exists did, but the teaching existed, but I could not accept this as truth and fact because it did not proceed from God. It did not pass the test of being assured of. It was unreliable. And the source I considered unreliable. Now, how are we going to help people to come to these thinking processes? I hear preachers say, you just do what I tell you to do. And I think, dangerous. I hear them say, I'm going to cast this vision. Uh, they may mean well, but every person must come to vision the same way the preacher came or someone else came to vision as God reveals himself to people. And so teaching them how to pray and know the mind of God, how to discover the Lord. You see, we, we have passed many things off for Christian education that are, that are as different as night and day from, uh, worse than that really, from real Christian education. Christian education, just as a, a little chat about God, that's not it. It's recognizing how God made people and helping those people to come to the knowledge of the truth, understanding that God made them and God is on the side of truth and will help them come to this, those assurances themselves. And with all these revisionists, not just revisionists in history, we used to talk about historical revisionists changing the history of America uh, to suit the spirit of this times, and that's going on all the time. 
and uh, even the even uh, constitution now they can't they can't change it but they can say it was for that time and now we're in a different time and we need this out of the other but it's not just historical revisionists people people are resisting this type of thing all the time trying to think well we've discovered in this enlightened time these things you believe it you take it you accept it we need a basis from which to judge is this true is this true and so uh, the nature of truth cannot be separated from God and then the fourth thing God's desire is for us to know him the greatest knowledge anyone will ever have is the knowledge of God now, when God gave us knowledge of Himself, He gave us knowledge of Himself in conscience and creation. Agreed? We have conscience and creation. God declares Himself in creation. God declares Himself in conscience. As a matter of fact, we have enough of the knowledge of God in conscience and creation to condemn us. We know there's a Creator God, and uh, we understand that. But God desires us to know Him. He's so serious about it that He gave us a book with words every word of it, we believe in the verbally, every word, plenarily, all of it, inspired word of God. He gave us a book to describe Him and reveal Himself to us. Now remember this, that His revelation to us is progressive. And our understanding of God will always be progressive. It's perfect in the person of Jesus Christ as God's revealed Himself, but the Lord told us, he didn't, he didn't try to argue about whether it existed or not. He declared His existence in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. Where did He come from? He always existed. He declares His existence. Now, He wants us to know Him. And He wants us to know that He is full of grace and truth. When Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, we've been dealing a lot with that recently, in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so, to know God, our greatest knowledge. And that brings us to understand in that area that we are to be personally accountable to God. I'm still in the same thought here. He's our creator, and we're personally accountable to him. That brings everything about discipline to another level. One of the greatest demonstrations I saw of real Christian education I saw long, long ago in a Chinese Christian school in San Leandro, California, with a woman who was a principal who was disciplining a child, a younger teenager, and she had the girl in her office, and she was saying to the girl, uh, I was listening in. The pastor wanted me to listen. I was listening in. Uh, are you a Christian? What do you believe the Lord would want you to do in this situation? Did you please Him in this matter? Not just had you broken a rule in school, disobeyed your parents, lied to an authority, cheated on a test, whatever the case may have been, but brought face to face with your personal accountability to God. Now that's what we're missing. God wants us to know Him. And to know him is not knowing just as, as an historical figure like you would George Washington existed sometime, but knowing God in union and communion with God. And we ought to give people an opportunity we're teaching to understand and discover God for themselves. Give them the tools. But God wants people to know him. And we're going to reveal a lot of that by the way we handle things. But he wants people to know him. And a Christian educator must always be alert to that. Because God will use opportunities not for disruption, but for entry, entreating people to come to him, to recognize their need of him. Uh, you may have a child or a young person who's been disrupted at home. And because of that, the emotion is running wild. They respond to things adversely, uh, disrupt class, aggravate a teacher, and we go, we go straight to the secondary thing and discipline that. And there has to be some guideline about discipline and procedure, but what's God doing? Has God opened that heart? Is that a moment God gives you to recognize? This person, I'm after, the Lord says. 
And the Christian educator is always aware that the goal is knowing God. And the greatest knowledge we'll ever have is our knowledge of Him. And just as it's progressive in the Bible, as we begin with Genesis, I use this illustration. Uh, when, uh, when Abraham was told he was going to have a baby and his wife's going to give birth, uh, before God did that, He revealed Himself further in this progressive revelation as the Almighty God. He revealed Himself as the Almighty God. And then He told Abraham, the Almighty God, with whom nothing is too hard, just telling you, you're, you're going to have a baby. You and your wife are going to have a baby. Impossibility? No, no, no. Not with the Almighty God. And God will reveal Himself to us in such a way that He, he grows larger in our, if you would please, our estimation of Him and our faith in Him. And so it's a lifelong journey, this unending discovery of the Lord Jesus Christ. We came to know Him, but how much more there is to know about Him. And a Christian educator is always aware of that, always aware of that. And may God help us. Let me give you a fifth thing. Our goal is to develop the mind of Christ. And often we think that is one-sided. We're trying to get this to happen in the mind of the, of the learner. But we are also trying to develop the mind of Christ in the teacher. The mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. But I want you to add that passage in Philippians chapter 2 with Colossians chapter 2. And listen to this. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so, if our goal is to develop the mind of Christ, we're after right decisions. We'll talk about how that's affected by theology a little later. But that's what you want. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what is there? I heard about him a long time ago. Even when people give their testimony, they refer to God almost in the past tense. Oh, yeah, when I was eight years old in Bible school, I got saved. I, I took care of the God thing long ago. You know where they get that? Because they see adults who have taken care of the God thing long ago. You know... Judgment must begin at the house of God. There's greater problems in Christian education today than there is in public education. Does that shock you? Because we've sinned against such light. And we've confined the access to it, to, to the limited, and we've gotten proud of what we know instead of grateful for what we know and share it with other people. I honestly believe Lee Robertson said to me, and he never got everything done he wanted to get done, but he said to me, when I had Camp Joy, I never charged a child. But I received more money from people than I would have received from camp tuitions. He said, because Christian people from all walks of life wanted to have a part in helping these children. And he built a mailing list in Chattanooga of 70,000 people, 178,000 people in, in Hamilton County but at the time. But people from everywhere gave. From other parts of the world they gave. 70,000 people. Why? Because it awakened something in Christian people to say, I want to have a part in that. I want to have a part in that. I want to have a part in that. You know what we've done? We, we have said all these great things we know, we believe, we've learned, but we're only going to share them with an elite group who've paid the tuition, jumped through all the hope, hopes and all those hoops and uh, conformed to every standard. And now we're going to instruct this elite group that we hope will in turn go, go change the world. Well, many of them do mighty things, but most of them walk out into a world and don't know how to affect the world because they've been trained as an isolationist, not as a person who goes into all the world and preaches the gospel to every creature. There needs to be a revolution in what we're doing too. But we're out to try to develop the mind of Christ. And instead of just saying, well, that's what we want in these kids, that's what we want in these kids, 
I think we had to say first, that's what we want in all the instructors, the mind of Christ. How would the Lord feel? How would God approach this? What would Jesus do in this situation? How would he respond? Well, we don't have to be in the dark about it. We can see he's given us examples in the Bible. It shows us. A sixth thing I want you to write down is life is only worth living because it represents more than mortality. Life is only worth living because it represents more than mortality. Now this is our union and communion with God. It's the basis for continuing education. This unending pursuit of the Lord. But it especially connects the eternal with the temporal. And that's one of the great goals of Christian education. We live in satisfy me now. You know, immediate. I want it. I want it. And it's affected everything. It's affected the way young people, when they get married, you know, they don't want bits and pieces from aunts and uncles and all that in the house. They want to go somewhere and get in great debt and get it all and have it just right now. But they've been trained that way. And the thought of eternity, I will we'll take care of that at the end of life. But the best way to live life, we all know as Christians, is to go out there and visit the threshold that we step off of into eternity and meet God in that inevitable meeting and then come back in the day we live and make this count for that. How does this count for that? So there's as few regrets as possible. In our generation, and at this time, suicide is, is among young people is, is um, well, someone has said more than 300% what it was when I was a boy. But it's not just people taking their lives, it's people destroying their lives all through life. They find no reason for purposeful existence. None. Would you ever have imagined that we'd live to see the day when 70% of 18 to 30 year olds had tattooed their bodies? And they're not just tattooing them now. It's like somebody's using for Etch-a-Sketch or something. You know, it's just, it's pitiful. Pitiful. And why, why all this disfigurement? Why, why all of this going on? Did you ever live, think you'd live to see the day when not only what's affected here, but through the media, it's not just affected here, but worldwide you have a generation of brainwashed young people who are listening to the same music, following the same things, and it's anti-God. Would you ever think, think you'd live to see the day when this whole evolution movement is now so, uh, so intellectually accepted, they say, that the first thing they want to tell a five-year-old when they go to kindergarten is that, let's talk about evolution. Surely nobody believes those foolish ideas about creation anymore. Well, what, what are we doing? What are we doing here? We have become a world where religion is, um, is all that is natural, naturalism. If it's, if it's anything to believe in, it's just us. And it's now. Well, there's always existed that. That's, that's found in the Word of God. But now it's so fully developed. It's, it, is, it is not just a part of, it's nearly the fabric of our existence today. So how do we, how do we help people as Christian educators understand that life is never going to be worth living until it's connected with eternity. Knowing God, knowing what He said, knowing what He taught. I mean, that's the thing that, only, that, makes, that makes any value out of what Christ came to do. That there's a real heaven and a real hell. If not, it's just a, a martyrdom, a tragedy, uh, a misrepresentation of justice or as Albert Schweitzer said, somebody who wasn't in his right mind. We've got to keep that in mind as Christian educators, that life is only worth living as it's connected with eternity. And then number seven, 
We must always connect belief with behavior. We must always collect, connect belief with behavior. What response are we going to get from this? What move to action? What we're teaching affects behavior. I don't think we'd be guilty as a nation of putting more than 70 million innocent babies to death if we hadn't thoroughly brainwashed a generation to believe that's not a life. That's why we must insist always that, that our philosophy, what we believe about life, must come out of our theology. Now, you know, it's sad. It's so sad that kids can go to a Christian school and graduate from a Christian school and can't tell you much about the Bible and about God. Or they, what's worse is they can tell you a lot about the Bible but can't tell you much about God. There's a way to approach the Bible apart from God. There's even a way in, in Bible colleges to study things like Bible doctrine apart from God. What meaning do these teachings have apart from the Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, if by Him all things consist, then everything should grow out of Him and be connected to Him. There's no standalone thing here. It only gains significance as it relates to God. How does this relate to God? What do we know about God from this? And so, if we're connecting, and we must do this, we must always understand that behavior is connected to what people believe. Uh, that's why we understand that our theology is the foundation for our philosophy. And often we talk to people about what they should do without talking about what they believe. Well, they don't want to do that because they don't believe that's the thing to do. I was eating the other day in a Papa Do's restaurant in Atlanta, and uh, they were having a party right over from me. We had a nice young lady, a black lady, waiting on us, clean cut, very kind. And uh, the people beside us were nice, but they were all covered in tattoos, young, old, I mean, young people, arms completely covered, everything, lovely people, beautiful people. And I'm not just on a hobby horse about that, but I want to know why do people do that to themselves? What are they thinking? And so I said to this young lady, I said, you know, I write books and speak to people and, about Christian things, and I, I want to ask you a question. Why would people do what they, they do to their bodies like those people? And I'm sure she was more sympathetic with that than I was. Well, she said, first, I don't have those tattoos. But she would say, she said, I imagine, I imagine it has something to do with the home in which we were raised, but it's basically impulse. This is her, her expression. Just impulsively, they are with somebody and they want to do something and they don't give much thought to it until that's, after it's done. It's a lot of impulse and they have it all done. Well, I'm sure there's other factors, but I thought about that. Where, where is the foundation of truth and fact in people's lives today? Where have people set the boundaries, the standards? Where is the character building? What are we attached to? And we shouldn't be just attached to, we should be founded on. You see, it's possible in Christian education to pass off instruction for real belief. And, and it's not really a part of a fabric of our existence. There's a lot of Christianity passed off that way. Someone years ago in my presence described that as barnacles on a ship. And when they go in, they could have them all sanded off. They weren't really a part of the ship. They're just a barnacle attached to it. Well, there's a lot of people who've attached things to the way they think. And it's really not a part of their existence. How are we going to help people? Has God made human beings so that they can accept things, hear things, see things, believe things, and those things become a part of their existence, a fabric of their, their existence? Has He made them that way? The answer is yes. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Not yet. Learned. 
and been assured of. Mm-hmm. And that's my life. I'm settled, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, I, I think anybody is apt to act impulsively and do something he or she would regret. But when we have a generation living on impulse, for the most part, I think the blame doesn't need to be all laid at the feet of that generation. It needs to be laid more at the feet of people who did not instruct them and help them to make these truthful things a part of their lives. That even gives me a greater burden to get the truth out. Are we going to spend the rest of our lives as Christian educators, are we going to spend the rest of our lives hoarding, hoarding, hoarding what God's given us? How can we get the truth out? That's, that's my burden. But our theology is to, is to form the foundation of our, our philosophy. We behave out of what we believe. And if we see behavior that disturbs us, then we need to go to the source and see then there's belief that's missing. The right belief is missing. Christian educators understand that. And so I'm just instead of spending all our time on symptoms and preaching and teaching loud and long about what we witness we don't like, let's go back to the source and try to change the way people think. Uh, we, we, are, we are an indebted nation. We're an indebted people. What can we teach young people about responsibility to God, to what God puts in their hands, about discipline, about patience and waiting, about earning, not just receiving? Uh, the average teenager can walk on a car lot today. If they'll give him credit, he can get any car he wants to get, not even pay anything down, drive off. Of, at least it was like that at one time. But what about the thought in that kid's mind or that young person's mind? What, what about that? Where do we need to start? I say as early as possible with homes and families, moms and dads, all of it. Let me give you now an eighth thing. And this is a sort of a pet thing of mine. Do not separate teaching from learning. Do not separate teaching from learning. I challenge you to go to the Word of God and find a difference between those two words. I challenge you to do it. Go to the Word of God and find a difference. In other words, for a person to get up and say, I gave them the information, they just didn't get it. That can never be a part of a Christian educator. There's a heart working, moving, passion going. Truth received and now truth given. It's not just I'm teaching but they're not learning. Teaching and learning ought to be going hand in hand down the road together. And that's very important for us to understand. I don't even like the attitude of myself and others who said, well, I gave it to them they didn't get it. There ought to be a passion for them to get it. Not a smart aleck protectivism on our part like, so, well, I did my job, they just didn't do theirs. Not a good idea. That's why we must have skilled teachers. True ladies and true gentlemen. Because of their influence. My wife had the privilege of raising two boys and I did instruct them. Spent lots of time with them. Specific times. And, but constantly, <laughs> you know, until Evelyn would say, enough, enough, let up now, let up now. And our daily devotions and that type of thing, reading the Bible and praying, that wasn't a preaching time for her. She believed that was a time where God could work in, in, in their hearts through His Word. And so I shouldn't just constantly be bearing down on it. And she helped me so much there. I've had a tendency to overreact on things all my life. But here we come to influence. I know that my behavior spoke more loudly to my children than my words. And so what qualifies a Christian educator? I think we ought to have true, courteous gentlemen and true, loving, kind ladies who behave themselves in a way that's becoming to Christ and being a Christian. Because Teaching cannot be separated from learning, and there are many things that are implied by that. 
Number nine, Christian education is not slightly better, it's totally different. It's not slightly better, it's totally different. I would say to you that I'm just throwing things out. It may not be any way to be verified, but I'd say 90% of the people who have their kids in a Christian education institution would say we have them here because they're getting a better education. Or we're, we're keeping them from whatever. It's not slightly better or much better. It's totally different. Education without God is not like education that begins with God. Education that starts denying a creator is not like education that says the first thing we're going to do is recognize we have a creator God and we want you to know about him. God is a God of design, all wisdom. He made the world. These things we have discovered about God and the way he made the world. Here, here's, here are ingredients in, in the chemical things and this type of thing. And God put all this together. By Him all of it consists. And if you get this with this, it doesn't work. And this, because God designed it. And He made, he made this all-wise God made the world. Before He created fish, He had a sea to put them in, you know. Before He made man, He had air for him to breathe. He's an all-wise God. And we're back to a lot of creative type things, but... I think we, we need to understand that it is totally different. And what you want, you want a person who walks across a platform with some sort of uh, degree or diploma who says, in uh, the world they say, I'm ready to do anything. And in the Lord's work and in Christian education, they say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And I can't do anything without Him. And those things need to be not just factored in, they need to be what we're doing. And that may God help us. So uh, the Word of God is always the foundation, not just integrated in. Our goal is totally different. We, again, want the mind of Christ. And we recognize the need for the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Regenerating and then illumining people. Number 10, Christian education is not confined to a classroom. That's something that, that we, we would understand better today than our, our good friends did 30 or 40 years ago. We, we rushed immediately in Christian education to build buildings, to have classrooms, to follow the pattern of instruction in the same format that the public school followed. Now, we understand that people are individual learners, though God made them, and they have certain things that are, uh, that are uniquely uh, characteristic of human beings. All of us have them. But every person is also uniquely different. They're different. And they learn differently. And this is not a factory. You, you say, we put this, 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 this in, and then we get this out. It doesn't work that way. And so it can't be confined to a classroom. People have the idea, and in, in I think old thought, that if we can get them in a room and, and we do this, and, and we've got 180 days of curriculum, and we, on day 37 we may be a little off, but we'll catch up before day, day 45, and we'll be on schedule. And now we put all these things in, and there has to be some way to guide through. I understand that. Some goals and objectives and, and defined things. But that doesn't mean they got it. So just remember, it can't be confined to a classroom. And that makes us reevaluate uh, tuition. It makes us reevaluate parental participation as opposed to parental responsibility. The public schools now have learned that parental participation is good, but they still don't hold to parental responsibility. We go all the way to responsibility. We believe it's the responsibility of parents to educate their children, not just to participate in the education of children. Now, and they would say, the world says, now, you, you, wait a minute. Now, you know, we're the professionals. We're the educators. You know, you can participate in this, but we're responsible. We're the educators. That's like a youth director in a church who said, give me your kids for four years. I'll give them back to you. And I say, fool you on you, buddy. I don't want you working for me. The real youth directors are parents. And so... Don't confine Christian education to a classroom. And then the 11th thing, that means Christian educators may be used of God in many different settings. Christian educators may be used of God in many different settings. You have a traditional classroom, but you have homeschooling, co-ops, tutoring, online. 
virtual education, adult education. Uh, you have local churches doing things to help people. And, uh, you know, God gave the home. He established the home as a primary place to learn. And with the breakdown of the home, we have the breakdown of people learning. So we have to step in and help. But it's not help, helping permanently to replace parents. I don't like that. The permanent idea of replacing parents. We should be working with the generation of children who are parentless to become parents who have their responsibility. There's a difference here. And so uh, we're taking a generation back to the Bible. That's, I think that's what God would consider true success and not creating, as the government does, institutions that really promote the institutions instead of helping the people. That's why you have, you know, second and third generations of entitlement and expect that the fourth is going to be in a generation of entitlement. And uh, we don't need that mentality in Christian education because it has no place in real Christian education. But let's do respect the idea that God gave kids to parents and they can choose how they want to educate their children. And if we truly are Christian educators, which we ought to be, and not just Christian school teachers, then the goal should be Christian education. And I have an idea that if we started this movement today, the emphasis would not be on establishing Christian schools. The, em em the emphasis would be on really promoting Christian education and then having the classroom as it's necessary, but also enhancing and helping every way we can with every other means of educating people. That's my idea. Now I'll give you a twelfth thing. And that's Christian education provides the only sure foundation for life. Now if that's, that's true, if it's true, you may not agree, then teachers, administrators prepare to train to their highest ability and preparing students to pursue all that God wants for them. But it also means it's not limited to a, a school. You can get your life turned around as a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old. And, um, and I, I think this is one of the things that troubles me so there's still some of this that exists. That everybody ought to be a, everybody ought to be a, everybody ought to be a um, missionary, an evangelist, or somebody in ministry. And so you don't need a lot of things, and that that diminishes the academic standard in a Christian school, because well, why do they need to study biology? Or, but you know they're just going to be preachers, or they're going to be missionaries. I, I don't I don't like that at all. It, if we say it's Christian, it ought to have the highest academic pursuit but motivated because we're trying to, trying to know more of God and what God's revealed in these matters. Oh, listen, we have diminished the, the possibility, not that a kid is possible with, with, with his ability, but what God is capable of doing through that person. But we ought to educate them with the idea that they ought to be equipped to do anything God calls them to do and really push that. Then the very last thing I want to say is just not another point, just, just to wrap it all up, that this is supernatural. Put God in every one of these. It's a supernatural thing to, to depend upon the Lord, to pray, to believe what God can do. I was with Evelyn yesterday. I didn't even tell her about this. For a little while, we went somewhere to pick up something, and uh, she was in a shop getting something for ladies only, and I didn't go in. And I saw a young lady coming out who had just part of one arm and both legs in braces, very nicely dressed, walking in a way to balance herself with her arms out like this, one leg terribly disfigured, but on her own, on her own. And I'm using this now as an analogy just in a moment. Well-dressed, well-groomed, every hair in place, someone you've enjoyed having company with, no doubt, 
or knowing as a friend who, who was at her best, but worked over every, under every handicap imaginable to, to attain that kind of physical appearance. I was sitting there putting all these pieces together thinking, and I think, how many people, how many people have we underestimated spiritually because we haven't seen this as Christian educators should have seen it? We've seen people we thought were some way limited, but in doing so, we've limited what God could do with that person. Um, I'm not an example. I really am not. But I do know, living where I lived and people knowing what they knew about my house, it's as though we had signs in our yard that said, church people stay away. We've got a mean daddy here. And he's not interested in church and everybody knows it. But God had a desire for that home and for that family. He just needed somebody to break through. And that's what I'm praying that God will help us do. We just need to break through. And the Lord wants to use us that way. I'm happy God has allowed me to be involved in Christian education and start a college and start numbers of Christian schools and all that kind of thing. But it's still about the supernatural work of God in one individual's life. Here I have all these years behind me now, and the thing I think about most are the individuals God has changed. And it has to be that way, what God can do in one person's life. And um, I, I, I'm ashamed that we haven't exported Christian education more than we have. I mean by that, we know we've got it. We've even built curriculum. It's available everywhere. But so, so few people in the world are getting it, and so many people need it. We've got to have a breakthrough. We have to. And that's, taking, that's going to take supernatural work of God to bring about that breakthrough, isn't it? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments. Guide us and help us now. Help us be true to thee and make this truth, if it is truth I've given, a part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm sure he was motivated why you would start a City Baptist. Oh, look. Can you imagine what he went through starting that school? Because it was a rival to his school. But he knew that people at the, at the Hammond Baptist, who were paying the tuitions they paid, who wanted their kids isolated from, from behavior that was unacceptable, he knew they would not accept that. And so... He, he went to the inner city and did that. And I think, honestly, that the same thing could be done anywhere. And you would have, you would have, you'd have explosive growth in that type of thing because there's so many people now that are so exasperated, given out, totally, totally at the end and beyond with public education they would just say, if you could help, we'll get on board. And um, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. That's my opinion. I think there's a, there's a lot of factors. If we could find the root factor, you know, I mean, let's factor in things like the closing of Christian schools on the fact that uh, people are, are in debt, that bankruptcy is higher than normal and ever, and um, that people are, are, are just not able to pay. Um, let's, let's factor in that one out of every three children that should be born has been aborted. Now that's not generally Christian people, but it might be a small factor in that, in that movement. I think there are many factors, but I believe uh, I think another factor is, is public education has tried to sell itself with uh, charter schools and lots of things. And, but I really believe that it is, it is a, a demise of 
genuine biblical Christianity. And people just do not have the interest that they once had. The fire has been lost. Now, homeschooling is growing. Uh, and some Christian school movements are growing. And, you know, there's, 20, uh, there's seven churches a day closing in America. I would say if we had a, a revival of church planting in this country, that on the heels of that you would see many young parents wanting a different kind of education for their children. But I think many of them would go to homeschool. In fact, in our college, when we started 21 years ago, nearly 21 years ago, it was hard to find a homeschooler coming to school here. But now more than 30% of our students, maybe 35, it might even be 40% this fall, have been homeschooled who come here. So it tells you something is going on there. I want to remain hopeful, but I, I think, I, I think um, one thing I would think about is if we could really convince people of how this is beneficial for society, for neighborhoods, for communities, instead of isolating people the way we have in our schools, that we would have much more, uh, many more people serving as benefactors and contributing to Christian schools in a community because of the good they did. But what we've done, we've isolated our Christian schools from the community and so the people have no vested interest in the education that's going on there because they see no benefit to their community. They're not helping people. They're not doing anything. They're just in and out, you know, like running in behind closed doors and the gate shut and, and you can't get through for the moat and uh, that's all around, the, all around the castle. And then when they let them out, they let them out and they run back somewhere to hiding and then run back in. When they play ball, they're isolated from them. And so uh, something has to be done about that, community involvement genuine Christianity and we've passed some of our separation off that's not really separation to God it's isolation from communities all those things need to be addressed but I, I don't I guess I'd have to think and pray and I have a lot to say what is the one thing at the root of it all you mean by open enrollment that people would not be Christians you can go a little further back than that. There, there are many schools that started out, you had to be a member of a church, of that church to get in that school. And I think soon most people started fudging on that a little bit. But then now uh, they would say uh, in, in elementary school you'd have to be a Christian and not, and, 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 uh, or, or in high school rather, in elementary we'd give, to give God time to work. Or you'd have to say that the family would be uh, involved in church. We used to say that they ought to go to church every service Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then, you know, probably half the Baptist churches in town only have one service a week. So you, you make these moves until finally you're faced with who are, what are we going to require for entrance? What are we going to require? And uh, there is a danger, and I think that you're back to conduct, uh, you know, drug users, this type of thing. Some of the arguing points are movies and rock concerts and all this kind of thing. But we have had our homes so invaded by these things, some of these things, that the, that the, that the uh, petitions have been broken down. People already access their children to some of this stuff through, God forbid, MTV and everything else, or HBO, that... They don't. They they can do all this and engage in all this and come to school talking about it and still come to a, a three service a week church, and say they're members of the church and all this other thing. So, it's a little more complicated than it once was. I think that I think that the greatest thing we could do is require parents to have ongoing education as long as their children are in the school, and this doesn't have to mean that they're they're inconvenienced greatly by having to come to meetings at the school all the time. There ought to be some meetings like that especially as children performing things. But there ought to be online access to things and, and requirements and things to pass. Like if you have a third grader, we want you to do this. We want you to do this thing online uh, within the first two grading periods of your third grader's year so you understand what we're trying to accomplish, the goals, objectives we're trying to accomplish in this third grader's life. That's what, that would be relatively easily, easily accomplished if somebody would work at it. So you're, you're helping parents continue to understand that their investment is a wise investment. See, basically, we didn't have to do that. We just said, all right, you, you get it. 
We've got to re-educate people. And uh, in doing so, I think we deal with your situation too, because people are wondering what, what, what is legitimate Christianity and what isn't. And uh, we, we just need to work at it. I, I don't know if I have an answer for you, but there's several things running through my mind all the time about that. We need to work at it. Christian curriculum or curriculum is a factor. We used to say that we need, we need a Christian philosophy of education. Uh, we need Christian curriculum that embodies that philosophy. And we need people teaching who embody that philosophy. I think what we've done, we've, we've detached things and almost, almost like if we've got Christian school books, we've got a Christian school. But how do they behave on a ball field? What's, what's gym class like? What's the attitude of the, of the teachers and the headmaster or principal about discipline? Is there any accountability to God there? What's the working relationship with parents? We live in a divorce culture. More than half the people in America have been divorced who have married. And some of them three and four times. How are we helping those people reestablish a home? Um, those, as they say, blended families. Um, what are we willing to accept? How, how are we talking about these things? How can we hold up a standard that's biblical? A permanency in marriage, this type of thing, and still minister to these people and not offend these children in such a way that they think we're against them, not just against the, the brokenness of their family. There's a lot of things here. And I, I think we just need to give it attention. It either, either it's going to have to get attention constantly, I, or, or we're, we're just going to struggle till we die. For me, it encompasses all of life. That's why I'm so strongly opposed to people getting the idea that we've got a school building stuck over here, and if we get people in it and out of it, they get a Christian education. It involves 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all of life. And that way it becomes a way of life. And that's not being conformed to the standards of the school. See, that's another error we make. We want to try to make them live like they live at school 24 hours a day. That is impossible. It will be rejected every time. When they're able to reject it, sometimes they can't do it until they're 18 and gone, they'll reject it. It has become a true Christian way of life. Now, what is that? Does faith make a difference? Does your faith make a difference? Why would we say an Orthodox Jew who really believes in Judaism and has followed it, and uh, some of these Orthodox Jews, why would they dress their children a certain way, girls in dresses, and why, why would they cover their hair? Why would someone go so far as to say only their husbands can see their real hair? Now, is this tradition? Most of it, of course, is. But they would say their faith made a difference in their behavior. Our problem is we have promoted a faith that's so weak that it hasn't made a difference in people's daily lives. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, excuse me, but we don't even expect a girl sometimes to be a virgin when she gets married anymore. I mean, we just think, well, everybody's doing these things. And that's, what have we done? And uh, one book I read that a lady wrote on truth says in one of the chapters, uh, Christianity met, met America and America won. American culture conquered the idea of Christianity and we have transformed it. Just one example. Many of these people who are tattooed to the hilt have got what they call Christian tattoos on them who get them from, from Christian rock bands, crosses and all this kind of thing. Where in the world, maybe now we've exported it, but where in the world would you have a church choir contest held each year in Las Vegas or somewhere like that who so has the greatest choir? What's that got to do with God and Bible and worship? So, but where do we, how do we change that? We go right back where we're talking about in Christian schools and young people and teach them biblical Christianity. That's where the need is. Yes, you're 100% right, you know. It's just 100% right. It's like taking a pen out of my pocket and say, it writes, yes, and not being concerned at all about how it writes and who made it and how it, came, how it got here and all that kind of thing. We just haven't taken care of all the pieces. We've got to go back to that. Like we're starting over again, I think.
I think it's making people aware what can be done, aware. But you know, a kid in a public school can get a Christian education and his home through Christian educators who are outside the school and uh, he can get the academic studies there. But uh, I, I don't think the answer is to demonize all public education. Now, as a rule, public education is public. It's publicly funded, accepting all people. And we say a, 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 a public school is, 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 is secular. And that means no religion, no religious order. That, that today is more meaningful than it would have been when we were, you know, and what about colonial America? What were there, 78 percent, 80 percent of the people in colonial America believing in God, believing in the Bible, maybe higher than that? Well, we have such diversity today and so, such complexity in faith. If you didn't have secular education in, 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 in public schools, you, you'd, have, you'd have every kind of religion in the world being promoted to your kids. And so... That, that influence battle was lost. It was lost. Not lost in the schools, lost by churches. And we've become a garden of gods, strange gods in America. And it's reflected, not originated, but reflected in public education day. What is there? 14,000 school districts, about 140,000 schools, and 60, 64, 5, 7 million school kids, and um, who's reaching them with the gospel. We shouldn't expect the school, what God gave the church to do, we shouldn't expect the school to be doing that.